Out of all of the things that I've printed in the last seven years, there is one design I can't get over. I'm talking about springs. And no, not that kind of spring, because that kind of spring just doesn't work well in 3D printing. Standard coil springs are difficult to print, so firstly, they need supports. But we're also talking about layering polymers on top of each other, and that doesn't work well with the kind of forces a coil spring is put under. There is a lot to say about 3D printed springs, and if you want a basic run through, I would highly recommend Slant 3D's video on it. There's a link down below, you should check it out. Instead of a coil spring, people normally print a flat spring for compression or extension, and these work pretty well, but my favorite of all time is this. We printed this last year. It is this fact's toothpick gun using a flat fishbone style compliant mechanism. What is a compliant mechanism? It's a spring, basically. It's any kind of device that uses elastic deformation to function. And usually these are very simple monolithic devices. Take a look at this compliant pliers and compare it to a traditional pliers. Whereas the traditional pliers uses two rigid pieces that contain the load and effort of a lever and a third, which is essentially a kind of bearing that the others pivot around, the compliant pliers is a one piece job only. One material, one piece containing both rigid and flexible portions. I think they're really cool, but I always wondered how strong they can be. How strong can this design be? See where I'm going with this? This is designed for toothpicks, so it's not exactly what I want. We can actually figure out the speed of the projectile using a chronograph and from that extrapolate its kinetic energy. For reference, an airsoft BB has a muzzle energy of 1 to 1.5 joules, depending on the rules of where you are in the world and whether you're a dirty cheater or not. But of course, an airsoft gun has a high-powered steel spring or a motor. We have a lot of competition. And I don't want to complicate things. I don't want to use a motor. I don't want to use a metal spring. I want it to be as simple as this toothpick gun, just a one piece device. Luckily, there are already designs online which have tried this. This is a beautiful design. It's all one piece with the springs built in. It's stunning. Let's see how well it shoots. What about this one? This is actually the result of a cooperative effort by Brigham Young University's Compliant Mechanisms and Robotics Group and Mark Rober. Again, beautiful design. It looks so intricate, but once more, it is just one piece. Let's see how far it goes. Well, that was pretty similar, maybe a little bit better. But to be fair, this was actually designed to be made out of metal, not 3D printed. So what do I need to do to make this tiny toothpick gun just as powerful as those? Well, I mean, there's one obvious answer. Scaling. The simplest idea works. To a point. Well, that was kind of crap. That was pretty much the same as the others, I think. So, I mean, it's an improvement on our tiny toothpick gun, but there's one big problem here. Look at the difference in size of the springs. This one is 50 millimeters and this one is 90 millimeters and our scaled up toothpick gun has the same range as the others. Clearly, it's not just about how big the springs are. I actually think that this many ribs are holding us back as we're really only bending them, not trying to stretch them. And if I pull more, I actually have a bit more space where the trigger catches the spring, so I can redesign it for maximum draw. All right, version two. So I got rid of all of the ribs, except three on each side. And I also changed the angle so they're a bit longer and thickened them a bit. Oh, okay, that's incredibly unstable. I should have realized that. Um, give me two hours. More stability this time with an extra set of ribs at the back. Could you see where it landed? Okay.
Okay, that was slightly better. So less ribs, greater length and greater drawback length does help. Uh, I also made the, the trigger mechanism compliant as well because one of our early prototypes actually just snapped when I was triggering it. Yeah, that's not bad. Up until now, I have been using PETG to print these. And PETG is lovely. It's easy to print and it's obviously up for the challenge, except that the trigger mechanism was mostly my fault. But we have other materials at our disposal, like PCTG. I wonder how well that will work. I guess I shouldn't be too surprised here. Luckily, I studied physics in university, so some of that knowledge came floating back to me. It is stuck in a dark recess of my mind between beer pong and saving Rachel, the daughter of the president of Circea. There's been a kidnapping. It's Rachel, the daughter of the president of Circea. So how does a spring work besides going boing? The force needed to compress a spring is linearly proportional to the length of the compression and the stiffness of the spring, commonly referred to as K or the spring constant. Spring constants can be much higher when using a stiffer material. That's why Mark Rober's design was designed to be made of metal. Uh, metal is pretty stiff. And that's why when we were making our bow, we used carbon fiber filament. Carbon fiber is pretty stiff. If you're wondering how to quantify the stiffness of a filament, then you need to go to the TDS and look for two values, Young's modulus and flexural modulus. Young's modulus is how resistant a material is to deformation under a direct load, and flexural modulus is how resistant a material is to bending under a perpendicular load. The higher these values are, the stiffer a material is. We are interested in both here. We are bending the spring, but we're also stretching it a bit. Unfortunately, not all filaments have these values listed in their TDSs. Young's modulus is often absent. I mean, it's not always that necessary. Most people don't 3D print their springs. You're probably going to see flexural modulus a lot more because people need to know how resistant that material is to bending. That's generally more desired. PETG has a Young's modulus of around 2000 megapascals. I'm happy to say that our own easy PETG does list E modulus or elastic modulus, which is just another way of saying Young's modulus in the TDS, and that it is 2,190 megapascals. By the way, you might also see tensile modulus mentioned in the TDS, which is generally equivalent to Young's modulus. Tensile modulus refers to elongating a spring. Compressive modulus refers to compressing one. And if they're the same, you can say Young's modulus for both. What about PLA? PLA is a pretty stiff, rigid material. Our own Eco PLA has a Young's modulus of three gigapascal. That's 3000 megapascals. It's better than our PETG. So would I use PLA for a device like this? Uh, no, uh, PLA has a pretty low yield strength. So if I did this, it would probably snap or deform permanently. It wouldn't work. So what about PCTG? Well, PCTG actually has a lower Young's modulus than PETG. So yeah, in hindsight, I can I can understand why it didn't work. So should I use carbon fiber? Well, with carbon fiber, with the bow that we made, it was pretty long. We had a lot of lever action for it to bend. Uh, the issue with this is the parts are quite thin and relative to their size, they bend a lot. So I'm pretty sure carbon fiber wouldn't be a good choice here. ABS also has a very similar Young's modulus to PETG. The problem with ABS, though, is that it also has a low yield strength. So if you use it here, it will, well, it won't work. It will work until it doesn't, and then it deforms permanently, and you can't use it anymore. We could also try nylon. Nylon is recognized as a pretty strong filament. We could try Polymaker's Copa, which has a slightly higher Young's modulus than PETG. Yeah. I honestly don't think the material is the problem. I just think it's not suited to this fishbone design because we're actually bending it more than stretching or compressing it. And Polymaker's Copa has a flexural strength that is actually relatively low compared to PTG. It's only 1,667 megapascals. So it seems that we're getting most of our strength from bending rather than compressing or elongating. 
What we can definitely improve is geometry and simply scale it up. So I scaled up one of our early designs until it's mega size, printed this on the Creality K1. Yeah, let's see how this works. Okay. But I'm just going to focus on smaller blasters at the minute. Not everyone has a 300 millimeter bed printer. Okay, so for the hell of it, I'm just gonna try carbon fiber. This is the Filaments carbon fiber PETG. Uh, it does not have a Young's modulus or flexural modulus listed on its TDS, but it only has 3% carbon fiber, which is pretty low. So I'm hoping it will be able to work and it won't snap. Uh, and it can stretch back to the trigger and actually do something. Let's find out. Yeah, it's pretty crap. All right, what about ABS-CF? Okay, so this is Eason's ABS-CF, and yeah, it's pretty rigid. Um, I'm pretty sure it's gonna snap. Yep, that snapped pretty much immediately. It seems PTG is actually the best material for this particular design. However, I have tried other PTGs. I've tried a Bamboo Lab PTG, a Filamentum PTG, and a Colorfab PTG, and they just don't work as well as ours, actually. Uh, so if you're going to make a high-powered compliant mechanism in a similar design, use our PTG. But I have obviously not tried every single PTG filament, so this design is now up on printables if you want to try it out download it use your favorite PETG or other film with it and report on the results so we can help other people build a awesome blaster in addition to the other smaller design changes we added this rudimentary charging handle here for a quick cocking and we also added this dart holder which just clips onto the top and you can put your dart in there if you need a quick succession of shots. I think it is about time we try these out in the field. So our lure to our victim um, volunteer, Monica, with the promise of lollipops and a new house plant. Yeah, this <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, that was really close. Oh, no! <laughs> Fell out. What? Did you get me? You got me, no! Oh, I keep doing that shit. Whoop. No! <laughs> Moving into the kill. <laughs> you didn't even get hit, stop pretending. No, I missed! <laughs> I have two darts left. Put them on the ground. Last one. No. Yes! Okay. <laughs> Good job. Hold on. Good game. You totally destroyed me in the first round. You totally destroyed me in the first round. It was just, I'm embarrassed actually. <laughs> okay, that was fun. I think we have succeeded in remixing this tiny toothpick gun into a monster blaster. I hope this information has helped you guys if you guys want to build a huge blaster of your own. Uh, if you guys want us to continue developing this, I would love to because one thing I want to do is add an internal magazine and make it semi-auto. Plus, I think we can make some adjustments to the power of the spring and the efficiency of the whole design because there's a, a lot of kickback when you release the spring. By the way, if you're interested, we recently got our new matte PETG in the shop. Nice, strong PETG, but with a matte look. 
I would have absolutely loved to do it with this project, but unfortunately the stars were not aligned and we just missed it. But it is in the shop right now. The link is down below. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you have any questions on what we did today, you may ask us down below. And if you didn't know, we also have a Discord server where you can talk to us and everyone else about 3D printed blasters and all other sorts of 3D printing things. We'll be back with another video soon. So until then, later. Okay, so since we recorded that, I have made some changes to the blaster. The spring is now stiffer. Uh, which improves the strength and the speed of the projectile. Um, the charging handle doesn't really work that well anymore because it's that stiff, but you can actually just cock it like this with your fingers. As for the dart holder, this just kept popping off uh, because the frame on top here would flex when you're flexing the spring. So I think I'm going to have to work on that for version 2. I might integrate the whole thing into a thicker frame rather than have it as a separate part, uh, but we'll see. But as I said, we have made some improvements to this thing. I'm now clocking it at around 8 meters per second, thereabouts. We have fired this particular version a lot, and I have started to notice some wear. It's not firing as far as it could. And this might be something that's just unavoidable with a 3D printed part with that much tension in the spring. But I'm cautiously optimistic, and maybe we can redesign around that. I'm including both versions on printables, the original design and, and the new stronger one. Uh, let us know what you think, guys, because I would love to continue working on this and improve its performance. See you guys later.